we come only to your throne. And we confess your God alone. Your God alone. At your altar lay our fears. For we know your presence and your here. Give to us you shown Oh such a great gift for mercy's sake and not our own It's of this greatness we attend for all to hear and to know your righteousness May your king be proclaimed may your power be displayed your power displayed as our voices sing your praise may your glory be displayed and should our word Comfort in the Lord. You're always there, always there, always there. For it's your love that grants our peace. And it's your hand that meets our need. May your kingdom be proclaimed.
tortured soul shall find rest beyond the I come to you this morning on Good Friday, the day that Jesus died on the cross for us. And I come to you uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I believe that uh, this is a, a message from above that will help us uh, understand what Jesus did on the cross for us. I want to read for us a scripture by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And the title of my message, The Cross, God's answer to our deepest need. 
And uh, as I preach this message, I really want to let you know that I'll be referring to some other scriptures which are within the environment of this title, namely Luke chapter 22, uh, Mark chapter 14, and within the environment of the institution of the Lord's Supper. I want us to really have a backdrop of where my, mes my message is coming from. Um, we are living in unprecedented times, we are told. All the certainties about life or about human existence is in a fluid state, is in doubt. Not long ago, scientists were debating furiously with the religious authorities in Wales that uh, the Bible should not be taught in schools because God is no more relevant and that science knows how to do and help human race. But now we realize that uh, science is in confusion. Uh, coronavirus has proven that uh, all the certainties now are in a fluid state. And we need to go back to the drawing board to realize that uh, science has not got all the answers. Just like uh, uh, President Kufuado will say in Ghana, expressing this sentiment recently when he spoke to the Ghanaian population, we know what to do to bring back our economy back to life. What we do not know how to do is to bring people back to life. God has provided the answer to this deepest human need in Christ. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. The night before the cross, he gave us insight into how he meets our greatest need on the cross. Now let's find out. At the Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is Luke chapter 22, verse 19. Then after the meal, he took a cup of wine and gave it to them saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. These are immensely significant words and actions for they tell us of Jesus' view of his death. So I want to cover four key aspects of what Jesus was saying here. Number one, the importance of his death. Number two, the purpose of his death. Number three, how to appropriate the benefits of his death. And lastly, but not the least, the hope that Christ brings uh, to the kingdom of God through his death on the cross. So number one, he had to die on the cross for our sin. We are told, according to scripture, in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, According to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness. And we are told in Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11 that God has given us the blood as a means of atonement. Now, Jesus, if he were to remove sin, then he had to spill his blood. And so, on the day, uh, in a few days before his crucifixion, on the cross, Jesus is giving us an insight that on the cross, he was going to die and suffer for us. And it's very important that we bear that in mind. That his death also is something that was not for him, per se. His death was meant for us. He died our death. And I want to give an example of two cases that happened recently. And uh, we are told that uh, 
uh, in the, this period of coronavirus, uh, there was a 72-year-old man in Italy who actually had issues with his breathing. And instead of uh, keeping on to his ventilation to survive, he passes it on to a young person and eventually dies. So this young guy survives the 72-year-old. And then we are told about a story of a, a fire that took place on the mountains of uh, Yellow Mountains in the United States. And we were told that the firemen, when they went to the place where the fire had burnt almost everything, they saw a bird that had spread its wings on the mountain. And uh, uh, the guy didn't know why the bird's uh, wings were still spread. And so he decided to kick the, the bed, only to find out that under the wings, the chicks of this bed had been protected because of mom's spreading of the wings, even though the mom was dead. And on the cross of Calvary, Jesus took our place. Let me cast your, uh, your eyes back to what happens at the Passover feast. At the Passover feast, what took place was this. Um, God gave instruction to the Jewish people that they should kill a lamb and post its blood at the doorpost. And when the judgment and justice of God were passing over the house, any door that was posted or painted with blood the residents in that house will be spared. And this did not discriminate. Whether it was a Jewish person in that room, or whether it was an Egyptian in that room, they were spared. And we even were told that uh, when Israel went out in Exodus, uh, there were a few of the Egyptians who actually followed them into the desert. So God's justice was met by the sacrifice of the lamb. And then we are told therefore that uh, Jesus had the Passover with his friends. When he took the bread, he said, this is my body that is broken for you. And in the same token, he took the cup and said, this is my blood that is poured out for you. So in the mind of Jesus, he is the Lamb of God, according to John chapter 1 and verse 29, who takes away the sin of the whole world. And so the blood of Jesus spoke for everyone that came from Adam up unto Jesus. And we have to realize that uh, in the garden, Adam fell. Be God gave him instruction that the day that you ate of the fruit of the good and evil, that day you will die. Adam ate of, the, of that fruit, and that day, from that moment on, started dying. His death started spiritually, until physically he died. And in the same way, Adam, because of his sin, all of us who came through Adam fell through him. So sin is not just something that you do, but sin is as a result of the fact that Adam is your representative and we all come from Adam. And we do what we do because we are sinful by nature. And in the same way, Jesus at the Lost Supper was saying that now he is the new Adam. He is the new person that God has brought. And remember, Jesus was a man and he was God. He was God-man. And so he could represent the human race, and also he could give eternal life, because God has the capacity to give life. And so Jesus, on the cross, not only died to save us, he also died to give us his life. 
So he replaces our sinful nature with his righteousness. And on the cross, Jesus took our place. And let me tell you, Jesus is dying on the cross for us was something significant because all of us, the Bible says that have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we are told that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Jesus on the cross, dying for us, solved our sin problem and also our death problem. Death come to us in three ways. Physically we die, and spiritually we also die. When you are sin is dominating your life, you are separated from the life of God. That is, you haven't got eternal life, and therefore spiritually you are dead. When Jesus comes in, and when he took our place, what he did was that he brought his life to us, and make sure that spiritually we begin to live. Remember, in Adam, spiritually we began to die. But in Jesus, spiritually we begin to live, and there's going to come a day when we will have resurrection body. But if you die in Adam, then permanently you are separated from the life of God. Listen to this scripture. In as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, and that through death he that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. And I'm telling you that on the day that Jesus died on the cross, when you placed your faith in him, on that particular day, God gave you a new life. He destroyed the fear of death forever. And I'm not saying that coronavirus may not take some Christians. But I, what I'm assure, assuring you is this. You must not allow the fear of corona to take you. Because the point is this, Jesus has already died your death. And the power and the fear of death cannot take you until God calls you home. And so I speak life into you now and declare that coronavirus is not your lot. And if God has not appointed you for coronavirus, then fear must not take you to go in that way. I declare that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will stand in the grace of God and overcome this death that has been brought about by the kingdom of hell. He wants you to remember his death for you. And by remembering, he wants you also to stand by faith and destroy the works of death, the fear of death in the name of Jesus. Number two, the purpose of his death. Jesus died on the cross. Look at what he says. He, according to Matthew, the cup stood for my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. A covenant is a means by which God establishes a lasting relationship with mankind. God had done so in the past. We remember the story of Abraham. God had a covenant of promise with Abraham and declared that through Abraham he would bless the whole entire world. Secondly, he had the covenant of the law, which we call the Old Testament, by which God was expecting that when people followed the law, it would brought life to them. But we, were all, we are all witnesses to the fact that uh, there were serious, serious uh, disadvantages and barriers of this particular law system. Number one, human beings didn't have capacity to do the law because our propensity to sin had been mad. And all we can do is to read the law, but we didn't have the power in ourselves to do the law. Secondly, 
not all of us knew God the way we should know. A few people have been earmarked to actually teach the law of God like the prophets and the priests. So it is not everybody who knew God or could actually develop intimacy with God. The people can go to uh, the tabernacle and make sacrifice, peace offerings and so forth. But that was all they could do. Most of the time, they were in their villages, they were uh, doing their own stuff in their own localities. So communion with God, intimacy with God, was not something that could be practiced anywhere that they were. Lastly, but not the least, the blood of animals, goats and lambs, could not take away the guilt and condemnation of man forever. But all this shortcomings Jesus said by the giving of his blood by the pouring of his blood now his blood was the means of a new covenant relationship that was being cut and listen because Jesus was God man as I have said before his blood was able to cleanse us forever his blood did have the potency to remove sin. His blood had the capacity to erase and cleanse sin forever. We are told that uh, this is a new covenant I will make with the house of Israel after this time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or man his brother, saying, Know the law, because they will know me, from the least of them to the, to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sin no more. So right now, in the new covenant, as Jesus gave his blood, he was saying this, that listen, the law of Moses applied the blood of animals. But now Jesus is saying that I am the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. So how does the blood of Jesus differ from the love of the sheep, animals, and the goats? Number one, by the new covenant, the power of God, the power to do God's will is internalized by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now dwells within us through the cross by the sacrificial death of Jesus to give us access to himself, to the power of God to do God's will. And that draws us closer to God because right now we have the ability to walk in righteousness before God. Secondly, in the new provision that we speak, what speak, we speak about in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, it is plainly clear that nobody will teach anyone to know God, but all will know God. God will be our Father and we will be His people. So the new covenant brings a new level of relationship with God an intuition, a living with God that surpasses everyone being taught by somebody else. It doesn't mean that we don't have teachers, but the knowledge of God becomes something that God communicates to us by the means of His Holy Spirit. Thirdly, these two provisions of the New Covenant are, are hammered in or pinned down by the, this last one, that through the death, the pouring out of the blood of Jesus, now God forgives us forever. And we are told in this verse that your wickedness and your sins I will remember no more. Hallelujah. God is saying that because of the pouring out of the blood of Jesus, right now, because Jesus was God man, that his blood was without blemish and without wrinkle, he is able to save us by his blood. And this blood speaks of better things than the blood of Abel. The blood of Jesus removes guilt forever. The blood of Jesus removes condemnation. 
If the Son has set you free, then you will be free indeed. On the institution of the Lord's Supper, Jesus steps in and destroys the, all the deficiencies that were in the Mosaic law. The blood of Christ, unlike the blood of animals, the precious blood of Christ had the ability to cleanse our consciences and deal with guilt and condemnation. So right now you and I have access to the presence of God forever. Hallelujah. Now, listen, we've talked about the, the fact that Jesus took your place. He died on the cross for you. We've talked about the covenant relationship that he brings and the benefits of that covenant relationship. Removing sin and bringing righteousness. Removing guilt and bringing a clear, clean conscience. Removing death and bringing resurrection life. Removing uh, curses and bringing blessing. This is a covenant relationship that beats anything that we've ever had before. But listen, you can listen to this till the cows come home, but if you don't appropriate what Jesus is saying here, it can never be something that can work for you. So Jesus, on the day that he shared or instituted the Lord's table with his apostles, listen, he took the cup, uh, he took the bread and said, this is my body, eat. So the apostle had to participate in the body of Christ. Then he took the cup and said, this is my blood, take it. So they had to take it and participate in it. And so it is very, very important that if you are going to benefit from the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, then you and I need to participate in it. Particularly if you don't know Jesus, this, this day when you hear my voice might be the only time that you may have an opportunity to give your life to Christ and participate in his death and resurrection. And I'm challenging you to do that. And if you will do this, as I have said before, the fear of the of death will be forever removed from you. I'm not saying you will never die, but you will not die before your time. Your time will come when God calls you home. And so you need to appropriate the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. By coming to an end, some exciting news I have for you. The death of Jesus also you know, when Jesus came to the earth, he said the kingdom of God is at hand because he came as a king of the kingdom. By his presence on earth, he inaugurated the kingdom. But listen, by his death on the cross, Jesus said this something, that I will not drink of the fruit of this grape until I drink it with you in heaven. In other words, and Jesus said assuredly, which means that Jesus was vowing that, listen, you and I who have put our faith and confidence in Christ, Jesus says, none of us will miss heaven. He will take us. He will drink the fruit of the grape with us in his Father's kingdom. And you know the kingdom of God on the day that Jesus comes, when the kingdom is consummated, will be the celebration of the feast of the bridegroom and the bride, the, his church. It will be a celebration time. And Jesus is saying, anybody who has put his trust and confidence in him, he himself, Jesus, will drink the fruit of the grape, the new wine in the Father's kingdom with you. So I'm telling you today that if you have placed your trust in Jesus, be assured and be confident that your life will never come to a wreck. That God, by his promise, by his oath, through the blood covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ, will take you to his eternal kingdom as he walks you through this planet Earth. But listen, if you have never known Jesus, let me read this song that we used to sing when we were scripturing on 
uh, young people and young women. And my wife wants me to read this to you. He says it, look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. It is recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. I have a message full of love. Hallelujah. A message to you, my friend. Look and live. Listen, in the desert, when the children of Israel were being destroyed by the serpent, God told Moses to lift up the serpent on the pole and leave it on the desert. That anyone who looked to that serpent and believed what God has spoken was made well. And today, I'm telling you that if even you are sick with the coronavirus, Jesus is now lifted on the cross. And the Bible is saying, look, my brother, look and live. Wherever you are, whether at home, whether in the hospital, no matter where you are, lift your eye, look to Jesus on the cross, look and live. Don't allow the fear of coronavirus to paralyze you. I declare to you that in the name of Jesus, it will pass over you if you will look to Jesus and live. And as I bring my message to your close, I'm telling you, you may be a believer, but you must live under the promise of God. You must live by faith and trust that Jesus is more than enough for you. And during this Good Friday, I want you to go home, reflect on the power that is in the blood of Jesus. The blood that speaks of better things than the blood of Abel. I charge you, my brother, I charge you, my sister, that death is not your portion. That you, can, you will live and declare the works of God in your generation in the name of Jesus. You cannot give up to coronavirus. It is not a weakness if this is the time appointed by you. But I'm telling you this. Do not allow the fear of this season capture you and take you where you don't belong. Rise up. Exercise your faith in the blood of Christ and live for God in this generation and declare that God is good. May God help us in the mighty name of Jesus. Right now, we come to a, a portion or a period where we put the words that we have spoken into action. I've been talking about the institution of the communion or the Lord's Supper and what it meant to Jesus just days before he went to the cross, what he was going to do the to, on the cross. We saw that on the cross, he was his body was going to be broken, and he said that. And so right now, as we hold on to this bread, we break it, recognizing that on the cross, the body of Christ was broken for you and I. And we participate in his broken body, and the church is unified because the bread is one bread. On the same night that he was betrayed as well, he took the cup, blessed it, and said, This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. The blood of Christ shed for us. Drink it. And as we drink the wine and eat the bread and share in these elements, we are participating in the new covenant. And the covenant of promise, because it is cast with the blood of Christ, guilt is forever removed. Your conscience has been cleansed. You are free to walk with God. The blood of Christ draws you near to the presence of God. The glory of God is around you, not shame. You will not participate in the shame of the devil. The bread and the wine, the new covenant, brings you into a new relationship with God, a new life in Christ. And this morning, I strengthen your faith to stand in and realize 
the potential of healing restoration that is coming to you because by his Christ we were made whole and Paul by revelation said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 that if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within you he that raised Christ from the dead will quicken your mortal body any element anything that is in your body that does not belong there because of the power of the Holy Spirit that is resident in you we cancel it and take it out in the name of Jesus because Christ now has brought the new covenant I pronounce the blessing of the new covenant prosperity and the presence and the power of God over your life anything that God has ordained for your life I can see you accomplishing it in the name of Jesus may this season bring every blessing that God has apportioned for you coronavirus will not touch you if God has not ordained that to happen and I believe that God does not speak death he speaks life may you receive life and live for the glory and for the honor of God we bless God and we thank God that he gave us this new covenant a covenant of blessing in Jesus name amen Now that uh, we're coming to a close, I want you to remind you of something. Jesus said something that I will not drink of this cup of the grape again until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Listen, until I drink it anew with you in the Father's kingdom. And I'm telling you, and we are also told that we should participate in the Lord's Supper until Jesus returns. But until he returns, we need to spread the gospel. And uh, until people go, the gospel cannot be spread. Until people preach, the gospel will not grow. Until people give for the spreading of the gospel, the gospel will remain stagnant. You and I are the people that have been blessed with the blood of Christ. And we are the ones who need to spread the gospel. So I'm encouraging you that as you look at me now, please do that which you do well every day, particularly in this season of Easter, so that we can expand the kingdom of God together. Uh, the details will be on the screen how you can contribute to the spreading of the gospel, how you can expand the gospel by your giving. And may God release a special grace and special blessing as you participate in this holy assignment God has given to us to spread the gospel by giving. And remember, give and it shall be given back to you, spread and shaken together, would men give to your bosom. It is more blessed to give than to receive. May God bless you with the gospel blessing of giving. In Jesus' name. Draw me nearer, nearer.
we lift our hearts. Come on, let me hear you. You 
Let me hear you. I will be still, oh God. I will be still. No will. Oh God, I will be still. I will be still. No will. Oh God. 